Hi, my name is Chris Polad. I'm a pediatrician and the creator of Little Pieces Club Ministries. This is where I take my special interest in child trauma, resilience, and divorce and combine it with my deep passion for biblical context, where we decode the biblical design patterns that help heal and prevent trauma. Along the way, I found that the macro stories of the Good Shepherd and the Tree of Life provide a framework to help us process, grieve, forgive, and reintegrate our souls, both in solitude and community. And we are able to live out the greatest commandments of loving God, self, and others. And so I apply this knowledge base to uh, families recovering from divorce and conflict and children recovering from trauma at all ages. So I hope you join us in today's podcast as we dig deeper into um, our subject for the day. If you would like to connect with us, we have a website at www.littlepiecesclub.com or .org. I have an email that's littlepiecesministries at gmail.com. And you can follow us at LPC Ministries on Instagram, at Little Pieces Club on TikTok, and at Club Pieces on X, formerly known as Twitter. And this podcast has a companion video on YouTube that you can follow. I mentioned the idea that context matters, but what do I mean by context? Many scholars today are looking at the differences between the ancient world and our modern world and telling us that we need to look at the Bible first through the lens of how it was written and how it would have been accepted by the people thousands of years ago so that we can then properly translate into our modern era how this amazing work of art gives us wisdom for today. And as I mentioned earlier, there are several journeys that we can see in metaphor form in the Bible. And the first is from sheep to shepherd. And then finally, the next one is to the tree of life. And we are always on this personal journey. And this helps us make sense of our lives and even the good and bad things that happen to us. I've put this together in a curriculum that helps me run small groups for children and teens and also mentor parents through conflict and divorce. One of the macro themes that we're also talking about is attachment, how we attach to one another, how our history of attachment works, and how we can attach to God, which will then help us love others. Welcome everyone to part 20 of Healing Journeys with Science and Scripture. This is our Tree of Life Part 2 episode and our capstone episode for the entire series. Overall, this is episode 77 in our podcast. So we'll start our review as we usually do. We went all the way back in our journey to the Garden of Eden, where we talked about the fact that men and women are celebrating each other and God in covenant relationship as as are connectos, and that is challenging, rescuing helpers, and how that relationship is to reflect the, the internal relationship that God has with the different components of the Trinity, and that when made manifest in the world, it is a tremendous community blessing. We also talked about the fact that love is what ties God, others, self, and the created world together. And that's what Jesus talked about in The Greatest Blessings. And that there are many concepts that support our ability to love and remind us the components of it. From patient and kind, love, hopeful waiting, grief, forgiveness, win-win submitting to one another, in right relationship, seeking to do justice with the use of wisdom, and that we should do all of this without the spirit of fear or a desire to think in very concrete, black-white ways. And that a very big principle is that of safety and that everyone is included. This includes our ability to discern who to attach to who are bad sheep and bad shepherds, who are lost sheep and lost shepherds, 
and the fact that the biblical ideal is male-female co-equality in celebration of their similarities and differences in their identities. And that this is all tied together by the idea of hesed attachment. And that is a loving, joyful attachment that God has with all of his children. And so we talked about the centerpiece of joy being what we are seeking as we return to the God space that is Eden. And once we took a look at this idea of Eden, we needed to take a look again at what Adam and Eve accomplished in the garden. And that is they started our journey of the flesh, the serpent, deception, and we added the concept of alienating God the father or parent from his children. And so what the serpent is accomplishing is deceiving the images of God to think that they are lost sheep surrounded by fear and shame and are ultimately alone and abandoned by God. And when this happened, we saw humanity take a downward spiral with adversity, sin, and hurtful destruction of one another. But thankfully, we have the healing journey where we go from lost and alienated sheep who are characterized by this worldly, shameful, self-focused, deceived, unforgiving, survivalist traits to becoming a good shepherd. And we do that by building this healthy attachment love to God, which is the ultimate resilience factor that can overcome spiritual deception and alienation. And that the science tells us that when we pursue this type of journey, both in solitude and community, that it renews our mind, grows our neurons to heal and changes our brain chemistry. But as we make this transition from lost sheep to good shepherds, we do need to remember that we can celebrate survival and invite Jesus to heal at the same time. So remember, we can reject black and white thinking. We've been cut off from the Father, and some of us in very, very harsh ways, but we can celebrate the fact that we have survived but that doesn't mean that we don't need Jesus to heal us at the same time. And we spent time meeting the Good Shepherd in its modern context and how healing a presence the Good Shepherd is for us. And we learned further about tools that we can take on our journey, and that is being able to find and attach to God through the Bible and rejecting the the deceptions that the Bible just is a simple rule book about who's in and who's out. More it's a story and a poetry and a love letter from our alienated parent to us on how we get back to him. We remember that our attachment is flexible, that even though our serpent's journey left us often with bad attachments, anxious attachments, disorganized attachments, because our caregivers have not fully reflected God's goodness, we can learn new attachment styles. We can test the spirits. We don't have to fully trust our feelings in every moment, but we can be curious about why our past has produced that emotional response and slowly alter that over time. We can understand more about suffering and how it strengthens us, and not use it as a reason to be angry at God. And we can remember the science of Sabbath and finding joy, even though we are in a tough or even suffering spot. And then we talked a lot about the idea of the Ezer Konegdo, or the rescuing helper, as something that we can look at for our own relationships. And remember, this is all tied together by the fact that we have the ability to choose. And even the serpent tries to convince us that our choices don't matter or that we don't have that ability to choose. So we remember that with this concept of a rescuing helper, that God's character bound up in the good shepherd 
is how he rescues us. And that of the seven I am statements that we read about in John, that sixth of them link directly to this idea of the good shepherd. And what is he trying to rescue? And he is trying to remind us of our identity in him, that it's already there. And we just simply have to get beyond the spiritual bondage that this world creates in our minds. And remember that we are God's children, Christ's friend. We've been justified and are united with the Lord. And we can look to the character of Peter in the Bible as someone who has had very negative traits throughout his walk with Jesus and who yet became the good shepherd after Jesus' departure. So that means that there is hope for us in our humanity as we walk with Jesus. And even we do things that we regret, that there is that hope for us that we can still become that good shepherd. And there are two special skills that we called out of the good shepherd. And that is the idea that they can fight, they can provide safety, both emotionally and spiritually for those that they walk with. And that there is a time for everything under the sun. And that gives us the wisdom question of what time is it that we answer with God? Is it time to find and or provide physical safety or spiritual safety? And then also good shepherds can grieve. And this facilitates forgiveness, which is something that is essential in our walk with Christ. And then we began to introduce the concept that God's character heals trauma. And we talked about the fact that God is an alienated parent and what that means. That when we return to him, that we don't see him as an angry, judgmental character, but that we see him as a parent who has been long-suffering for his children to return. And again, we've talked about the Good Shepherd. And last week, we began to dig very much into the concept of the Tree of Life and how Jesus manifests this Tree of Life concept. And again, we are too as well. And we talked very much about the biblical foundation of this idea so that you know that it is truthful in your walk. And then we spent time talking about all of the different aspects of the Tree of Life and that is the light that Jesus and, the, and God provide, that we have an aspect of this that occurs in solitude, and then also our walk in community that all can see. And we see that we have to grow through the soil, which is who we are, and part of our identity is soil that has been breathed to life with the Spirit of God but yet our roots have to grow past rocks, deceptions, and idols. And that our weathered, scarred trunk becomes a thing of beauty to behold as our tree of life continues to develop. And then we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. Some make a lot, some make a little, and that we're all part of God's kingdom, no matter how much fruit we produce. And that God helps us grow by lifting our trunk out of the dirt, keeping us from molding, and that he is an active vine dresser. And then we can also remember, though, um, going back to the dirt analogy, that he is a potter trying to form us. And that Jesus is the bigger tree of life behind us that forms this forest community. And that by thinking of Jesus as the tree of life, and then thinking about the idea of communion, This is God allowing the new humanity to eat of the tree of life in the Eden space that we were told that we should not eat of that. So with that long, long review of where we've been, we're going to wrap up our tree of life journey with a practical exercise and a little bit of discussion And then we will wrap up the entire series. So in a journal or on a sheet of paper, take a few minutes and pause the podcast 
and just draw a tree. That's your instructions. Draw a tree. And when you come back, I'll explain what we know about drawing trees. So you may need to watch the YouTube video of this one, but there are several aspects that art therapists key into when looking at tree drawings with their clients. And so we'll go over those for right now. First of all, oftentimes people will draw a trunk with a scar or a big hole in it. And if you mark the bottom of your drawing to the top of the drawing, and you put your current age at the top of the drawing, and then you look at where that scar happened, that is approximately the age at which some major trauma occurred in your life. And so the other thing that you can look at is the wideness of the trunk. If the trunk is very wide, then you do have a very secure and confident attitude. And sometimes people do not draw roots, and that means that they may not have a deep root structure to draw from. And then you can look at the crown of the tree. If it's soft and kind of flowing, that means one thing. That means um, kind of a good, robust crown. And for some reason, if there are pointy um, points to the leaves that you've drawn, drawn, that often links to a sexual assault. We're not sure exactly why, but it's almost a universal trait of people who have been sexually assaulted. If you look and you've drawn a sun and it's on the right side of the paper, that means that there is hope for a bright future. And if you've drawn the sunlight on the left side of the page, that means that a lot of your um, brightness and hope has been in the past. And that may not necessarily mean that you don't have a bright future to look forward to, but you may be thinking that it was more in your past. And this is a very, very busy slide, and I just offer it to show that what we do in Little Pieces Club is based on a curriculum that I put together that is modeled after the Tree of Life. And what we call the private Christian journey is, in essence, our walk with God privately, and that is the root of our tree. And then that is balanced with the public Christian journey, where we see the trunk, the branches, and the fruit develop. And so each one of the items on our curriculum is something that we do on either side of this drawing. And so we can um, look at the middle part of this drawing and see that grieving and forgiveness um, and realizing that even in our suffering that we are not alone, we are not alienated sheep or children, and that forms the basis of our spiritual identity. And then we can embrace our power to choose, get to know God, and to develop a shalom mindset. And then if we go to the community side, we talk about Sabbath and community, understanding power between individuals, embracing the Ezer Konegdo concept, listening deeply for understanding, um, wise attachment, and then finding win-win-win wisdom, which is living out the greatest blessings. So you can see that the tree of life concept can be um, use, useful as we consider our self-growth and transformation with Jesus. So we'll go into our assessment, testing, and sifting our minds uh, today before we get to the summary and wrap-up of this series. And so a couple of questions to think about is, what flowers and fruit are you producing? And that is, what part of you draws other people to you? Thinking about an amazing tree that may even be radiating with light and love and fruit and flowers, 
The concept is that people will naturally be drawn to you. And then, do you see your weathered trunk as beautiful? In other words, the adversity that you've lived through, has that created some beauty in the way that your trunk has formed? What scars might be there, maybe that were revealed in your tree of life drawing? And then what are or were the rocks, barriers, or idols and deceptions that your roots had to grow through before they deeply and lovingly connected with the concept of Jesus and his living water? Are your, is your tree actively growing or are you a seed that is still soaking in the water of Jesus and hasn't really sprouted yet? Now, in this idea of testing the spirits, we're going to do an, another exercise, or you can do this in your journal, which is draw your future tree of life. What are you going to look like after you've healed? So in a journal, spend time drawing what you as your tree of life will look like in five years, in 10 years, and in 20 years. And for community discipleship, think about someone you have the opportunity to walk with. Ask yourself if you fully know at least the significant narrative from their full timeline. And we're going to go over that as we begin to transition into the capstone aspect of today. And that is bringing all of this together and how we disciple ourselves with God and with others. So remember the discipleship timeline. And that is, we all begin from a family of origin. And what were the circumstances in that family of origin? What was going on in the pregnancy? Was someone stressed? Or was there a lot of adrenaline, cortisol, or other foreign substances that might have interfered with brain chemistry? What was the first one to two years of life looking like for a child? Did they have good attachment or did they have a poor, um, anxious type of attachment? What was the young, um, young child like? Were there behavioral problems? Were there ADHD type symptoms? Did depression and anxiety or agitation set in in teen and preteen ages? Was there sort of a bipolar type of a disintegration that happened? Is there substance abuse, risk-taking um, in the teen years? And then what happened in the young adult world? Was there a sleep effect? If they're old enough, did you see their prefrontal cortex develop and suddenly bring a lot more order uh, to their emotional life and planning? Or were there relationship challenges as well? All of these things you need to have a sense of if you're going to be properly discipling people. So as you think through that entire timeline, how would the principles of Tree of Life apply to them? Do they understand patience and slow growth? Have their roots tapped into the living water of Jesus, or are they seeds that are still soaking in Jesus' living water? What scars do they have? Any type of trauma that they've lived through? Has God tried to prune their branches in the help, in the hope that they will create greater fruit moving forward? Ask Jesus to guide your steps with them. Are you modeling the law of the farm, which is patience and investment as you walk with them? So now we get to summarize and conclude this long journey that we've been on uh, through the podcast. And we remember that the basic idea that we're trying to go after is that Hased attachment or deep, loving, secure attachment to God is what heals trauma and always has. And it does it by integrating the mind. And we learned the fact that the right brain is our fast track. When we make snap judgments or our tone of voice comes off badly, Usually that's the right brain responding to the training that it has gotten throughout its entire life. And when we apply Hasset attachment and begin to rework some of those emotional scripts, that that's what brings 
awareness and healing and that we try to live past the aspects that have caused fear in our lives and that also brings uh, amazing amounts of healing to our brain. So as we become individuals that have a brain that is integrating much better with this idea of love, then communities can integrate as well. It's amazing once you learn this concept of a right brain operating before a slower left brain track, that you can begin to see that operating in society as well. And so we spent a lot of time talking about God as an alienated parent and the good shepherd and tree of life. But what I realized is we did not spend a lot of time on the scripture of the alienated parent. So we're going to do that for the next uh, few minutes. And where we see this, and that is God as the alienated parent, is in the parable of the prodigal son that can be found in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. So you can stop and read that if you would like. But the basics are that, and think about it from the aspect of the father. We can always kind of shift perspectives when we read a story. But in this case, what we're looking at is God as the father. And so you had a son who, in their cultural context, basically said, I want out of this family. God or father, you are dead to me. I want my inheritance so I can leave. And so we can see the sadness that this father must have gone through, and yet he provided for the son's request. And the son went, and the son spent everything, wasted it, and then was challenged to humble themselves to come back into the father's life. And so what we see in just a moment, we'll see a a picture of this. But when the father sees the son coming and runs to the son to embrace him, there's a subtle contextual clue there about God's character. And that is, that son would be seen by the community as a very bad sheep. And they would have a ton of uh, hatred or um, negative energy uh, for him. And God recognizes that and runs to the son, which is a shameful act. So suddenly the community's attention would be drawn to the father's shameful act, not the son's shameful act. So that is a way that the father in this story can protect the child who's coming back. And so we think about that in terms of God's character when he looks at us. And we've talked about the fact that he's an alienated parent. And just think about the character strength that has to occur when we've been alienated by a, a child and that we can still do that to protect the child as they come back. And then we see this running, and that is exactly um, the shame, the shameful act that the father does to protect the child. But then we also have another character, and that is the son who remains in the story. And we see a deep look in his character when he is bitter when his brother comes back. So even though this son has stayed within the household of the father, they still are, in a spiritual sense, alienated from one another because that son maintains this bitterness and lack of forgiveness at his brother. And so when we think about this from the standpoint of an alienated father, this father is living closely with a son who doesn't have full forgiveness in his heart, but then was physically cut off by another son um, by distance and even um, told that he didn't want to be his, his son anymore. So that we can see how this adds to the kavod of that father. And so, and we know from a scientific investigation of alienated parents in our modern context, that this idea where a child will willingly cut off a parent for honestly no good reason 
is what the alienated science shows us. That causes tremendous suffering in the parent. And so now we can see this full picture of God as the alienated parent and as the good shepherd and the tree of life. And so I can call this the trauma healing trinity, where we have an alienated parent, good shepherd, and tree of life as very, very rooted in scripture or very deep characteristics of God rooted in scripture that have healed trauma for a long, long time. So a couple of thoughts about the healing journey, and that is using discipleship and science and scripture together. And we can look at the idea of even marketing the Christian faith out in the community. And we can make a choice moving forward that the Good Shepherd becomes the way that we advertise. Because if you think about the idea of just focusing on the crucifixion, that honestly triggers a lot of people. And so I think as a society, and as a Christian community, if we begin to focus a lot more on this good shepherd aspect of God, it will naturally draw more people into a loving relationship with God and Jesus. That is what they need to heal trauma. And when you are walking with people, we often are able to see behaviors that end in control. And this, this can be speech patterns or behavioral patterns that are working towards control. And one of the ways that Karen Purvis and the TBRI folks talk about this are, are you asking or telling? So people that are into heavy control do a lot of telling because it's not easy to be vulnerable to ask. But what I'm trying to talk about and draw attention to here is, is that what's at the root of control is anxiety and fear. And so there's a need that they are serving by this controlling behavior and being curious about what the anxiety and deep fear is, is going to help you move them into a place where they do not need the control. And so we can model patient and kind and slowly encourage them and influence them to get into an idea of either asking rather than telling. And the root of wisdom is fear of the Lord. But what I hope I showed in a lot of the episodes is that there needs to be a constant invitation to Jesus as we are walking. When things come up, get in the habit of saying, Jesus, walk with me in this, and check in with God often as you are behaving, walking, and doing life. And the other thing I want to make sure is that we are ready to see and respond to the spiritual bondage that people may be in. And I think this has been a slow journey for me, getting used to this idea that the spiritual world is really active in my Christian walk. And Neil Anderson's work um, really made that come to the forefront. And so you need to have at least a curiosity about if someone's mind is truly being bogged down by an evil influence. Now, I'm not talking about possession. In the spiritual world, they just need to Um, bind up our mind with evil thinking and shameful thinking and reminding people that they are cut off from God, which is uh, deceptive, and just realizing that those deceptions may be there. And so, uh, and then being ready to uh, intervene prayerfully, uh, providing that good shepherd spiritual safety for the individuals that you're walking with. And what I did not spend a lot of time on in the healing journeys is the journeys specific to males and females. And one of the reasons is because there are uh, very good materials out there that I'll talk about in just a minute. But I do want to highlight that there is a masculine journey that helps us know our 
masculine selves much better and that women might benefit from knowing that masculine journey as well as they walk with and are in intimate relationships and as are connecto relationships with man with men and this is a concept of parented by god that john and stacy eldridge have captured in their work uh, podcasts and books and that there is a feminine journey as well uh, that you can look at through this parented by god lens uh, that they give off and that they talk about but what about the lgbtqia plus journey and the gender issues that we see in our modern context and yeah i i did not spend time focusing on that in this journey uh, or in this podcast series but i do want to honor people who um, are walking the path of lgbtqia there is a qr code in the video episode of this podcast that links to a message given by a woman by the name of linda seiler and she does a very good job of talking about this issue and in her personal walk when she was very very young she even though biologically female identified as male and this was the youngest case that i've heard of this but she talks through her story of slowly connecting through Hasid attachment and those are my words not hers of Jesus through her teen years and early 20s and that she has found her identity as a as a female and is now enjoying uh, dating and being in relationship with men so I just say that as not a have to for people who are in the LGBTQ plus space but I also want to point out that there are many stories that don't get told that expand our thinking about what's going on in lgbtq uh, scenarios so i do want to give that suggestion of looking into that for those who are curious about it and that is for people who walk alongside those uh, with lgbtq um, uh, lifestyles and for those that are actively um, in it and wondering how they connect with God. So the resources that I want to talk about is John and Stacy Eldridge. Uh, And we talked about the fathered by God and Stacy's work is called captivating. And that is um, understanding the female's needs and journey. And I've talked about Neil Anderson's work in um, breaking bondage, the, the evil that gets wrapped up in our minds. I've heavily used the Bible Project in uh, as the theological rock for much of what I've talked about. Uh, Kenneth Bailey is an author who has written several books that are relatively scholarly but are amazing treatments of getting back to uh, what was intended in biblical literature in the uh, first, second, and third, and first couple hundred years after Jesus. Um, Nadine Burke Harris has a wonderful book um, called The Deepest Well that talks about trauma. The Karen Purvis Institute at TCU um, painstakingly over 20 to 30 years um, looked at the scientific basis of healing trauma and I believe um, has proven a lot in science about the Good Shepherd concept. Uh, Kurt Thompson is a psychiatrist that's written several books and has um, social media uh, groups. Uh, His are called The Anatomy of the Soul and The Soul of Shame, uh, which are excellent. Uh, Emily Nagoski has written a book called Come As You Are, which focuses uh, primarily on females' sexual health. It is a relatively secular book, um, but I think she's got amazing information Um, to help find sexual health in folks. Uh, Jim Wilder I mentioned a few times, but he has a couple of books that um, talk through these neurotheology concepts that we've been talking about in Healing Journeys with Science and Scripture. 
and that with Little Pieces Club, which is the nonprofit that um, I have wrapped Little Pieces Club Ministries in, uh, we have a grief workbook that I bring to workshops. Uh, there's uh, three books that you can find on Amazon. One of them is Do Clouds Get Divorced Too? And this is written for parents and children who have gone through divorce for them to read to one another. Um, and then there is Preparing for Marriage with Science and Scripture, and then Marriage Rescue with Science and Scripture. And so both of these have very similar concepts backing them up, um, but are written as 40-day devotionals uh, to read through um, to help prepare and or uh, repair uh, marriage uh, relationships. And they have many of the principles that we talk about in the healing journeys with science and scripture. And then finally, the podcast. Each season has a little bit different focus. The first season are our small group sessions so that parents can understand what we talk about. And that is the framework. And the framework of the Tree of Life is how those episodes are organized. And then season two was a lot of um, FAQs for divorced parents, uh, including some interviews with experts on parental alienation. And then this podcast series has been uh, exclusively related to the healing journeys with science and scripture. So I hope those give you some additional resources to dig into if you would like to uh, find out more about the concepts that we pulled together uh, for the healing journeys with science and scripture. So as always, I'd like to pray this podcast series to a close. Dear Abba, Heavenly Father, it has been quite a journey. Thank you for being our patient and kind alienated parent, for being our good shepherd who can rescue us and our tree of life. And thank you for calling us to understand your character so deeply that we can reflect it and then bless others with the boundless love you have for us. Thank you for the healing that comes through relationship. Thank you for the wisdom that comes through suffering. While suffering is hard, we go through it and understand that we can see its role in our lives, and it makes reunification with you all the more sweet. Lord, we take authority over the remaining evil in our lives and minds and repent of the behaviors and thoughts and deceptions that we have acted out on the influence of this evil and that we have done these things in the name of evil. And we say again, the evil we have done is not yours, Father. We acknowledge now that we are your cherished, precious, and loved children forever. And we can't wait to, to walk closer and closer to this reality with you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thank you for spending time with us in our Healing Journeys with Science and Scripture podcast. We just hope that it is a tool for you to grow and transform into good shepherds and trees of life and understanding when you see alienation, what to do about it. I look forward to hearing from you through likes, comments, shares, and please help us expand our ministry um, and share with others. And for now, I bid you shalom and peace. Thank you.